happy to be here with David Miller, CEO of LA Photo Party, and I think I have an obligation to start the conversation uh, with, uh, I remember one day I was just opened up TikTok randomly, you know, scrolling through, and I saw, I'm like, that's David Miller pop up on my, on my, my what's it called, my feed? My yeah, for you page. Feed. For you page, for yeah. For you page. Right. And I think I TikTok. messaged you, I'm like, is, is this really you? Because it was getting millions of views, and uh, I included it in the booth report, and I think you got into all these ar- other articles. So it was really about your story of how you got the NASA job. So I think that's a really interesting thing about you uh, that's unique. Uh, before we get into the photo booth stuff, can you tell people a little bit about how you got into working with NASA and space and stuff like that in a TikTok clip? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was kind of my background. I went to college for mechanical and aerospace engineering, and... You know, I was looking for jobs after college in Boeing and other mechanical and aerospace things. And it was a Boeing job I got interviewed for, for working on the Dreamliner at that point was still a new plane. It wasn't flying yet. It was just a phone interview. A few weeks later, they called me back and said, hey, there's another job. Both of these are in Houston that you might be interested in. And I was like, great. I guess my first interview went well. I'm sure you're going to be flying me out there for a in-person interview and I'll figure out which job is right for me. And uh, a few weeks later, they called me and offered me the job. And I thought it was that first job on the airplanes that I had interviewed for. And when I got there, I found out it was actually this other job that I had heard about for about two minutes (laughs) on a call and thought I'd get more info on. And uh, it turned out really well. I think it was a better job for me. It was working on um, uh, the International Space Station program, which uh, was pretty awesome. And I worked at, at NASA as a contractor for about eight years uh, while I was down there in Houston and did a, a number of different jobs. And, you know, it was, did, did some really cool stuff. Uh, I think the International Space Station just sounds cooler than, yes. you know, the Boeing Dreamliner. Yes, the, uh, the wire harnesses to get the seat back uh, screens to work. Was that what, what type of stuff you worked on? What did you, so like? That would have been the other job. That would have been the other one, okay. Yeah. So what did you actually end up doing? Uh, so my that job for the space station was, uh, figuring out how and planning how to use the robotic arm on the outside of the space station to do different things. The big things would be taking things out of the space shuttle cargo bay and putting them on the space station. When I say things, we're talking entire new module rooms of the space station, the size of like a school bus, um, some smaller things too. But um, you kind of got to figure out how to do that and make sure it works within the limits of the mechanism as well as you just don't want that like elbow hitting the space station Mm -hmm. and, you know, poking a hole. So I used to like to say it was like playing a, uh, a computer game of like a claw, claw game where you grab the stuffed animals, mm-hmm. but like with a space station. Mm-hmm. And so that was that job. And I, I ended up working on a number of different things while I was there, um, including my last job was working to support uh, spacewalk hardware and cargo docking systems uh, that I did for a while. So I got to be in uh, the mission control center whenever there were spacewalks or cargo dockings and got to support that. And that was really cool. Um, the, the reason that's so fascinating and interesting is because obviously that mechanical engineering background where you're building these cool things comes into play also when you're building these award-winning photo booths for the industry. Um, I also had the privilege of uh, interviewing and getting to know your brother, Brian. I always really liked him. I admired him. And he's living his dream out in Hawaii right now, right? Um, I'm, so I'm curious, how did you go from the NASA work to photo booths that's quite a leap like how does that even happen it, it is quite a leap and it uh it didn't it, it was a slow transition it was uh you know i was starting to get a little burnt out on the nasa work there's a lot of cool stuff but uh, i like to say there's also like endless spreadsheets and i was in a giant government bureaucracy in a giant corporate bureaucracy you know working for boeing as a nasa contractor it's there was a lot. So it was a lot of cool stuff, but a lot of stuff, you know, that I wasn't too hyped on. And I was always helping Brian out. He was running the business. Um, but from the start, you know, helping him out with the tech from afar and when things were in Houston in my area from close up. So I'd been a part of the business just kind of on the side. And it was actually uh, at an event. A bunch of us flew out to this event in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. That was a, a holiday party, and it was freaking like zero degrees and ridiculous. And I remember it was just so cold. And I approached him and said, "Hey, uh, I was also really looking to move back to Los Angeles um, from Houston, where my whole family was." And I said, "Hey, what do you think about me coming on? You're growing. I can handle all of this tech. 
and he was stunned. He had no idea it was coming and said, hey, I don't think that's going to work, which is totally fair. <laughs> and I went back to work. I didn't, ex- I didn't expect that part of the conversation. Wait. I think this story was longer than you uh, anticipated. <laughs> I went back to work for NASA, and like six months later, he said, you know, hey, the tech is getting harder, basically. Mm. Do you still want to come on? I think we need somebody. And I said, you know, I'm now in like in the middle of these projects I committed to. I don't know that it's the right time. I don't feel right about leaving now. And it was like another six months. We like got back together and finally, you know, made it happen. And I came back to LA and joined the team. So is there anything in particular about the industry or the, the work that drew you in? Or was it more you wanted to move closer to family and, and that you were kind of burned up from the NASA work? Uh, all of the above. I definitely wanted to, to move closer to family. I was a little burned out on the NASA work. But uh, I mean, the stuff I had been working on had always been kind of creative and fun. It's, it's you know, it's not the same type of technical challenge, though there are those for sure, even in the photo booth world, but just uh, a lot of creative challenges, um, both on the tech side, finding new cool things to put in software or hardware, but also like on the event side, a client comes and says, hey, I have this thing I need to promote. I want to do something really cool. Wow me. And you just got to come up with something. Mm. So uh, I was definitely kind of pulled in a little bit by the the creative challenge. Are there any specific examples of, you know, product tweaks or things that you changed about products based on your experience with your engineering background? It's hard to come up with like a specific thing because I feel like that's built into kind of everything. Right. Um, on my end now, it's a lot about the systems and building the kind of the company and the the support structure to to handle everything well, rather than little specific things. Um, the though I try and get in all kind of all those little things too. Right, they all add up. So yeah. how did that transition to now you running the show? Um, you know, Brian was kind of looking to get away is where it was obviously he had changes with his family and new kids and was looking for a big change and so again we kind of had discussions of how that might work and you know there were some some ups and downs there but we figured it out and you know he moved off to hawaii and has his farm and yeah kind of, i see uh, i see the pictures i get jealous yeah. he's always posting about needing workers i'm like ah maybe i come down for a month or two it's it's <laughs> tough and um it's really tough to leave whenever you visit and some people have gone for a week and stayed for eight months wow. so uh wow it's happened um w- one of the things i really always liked about la photo party is because <clears throat> there's a lot of vendors in the industry that don't have the experience that the boothers have and i think you guys are in a unique position where you're not only building the boots, you're not only building the software, you're also working events. You're, you're doing like big activations. So you get the, the uh, perspective of the customer as well. Uh, are there any learnings that you've had along the years that your, your team has had that you can share? Um, whether it's an open-ended question, like things people do wrong, things people should be focusing on to do better, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, as far as what people should focus on on the event side, I think what a lot of people miss is having a backup, not for tech, but for your people. So for example, for all of our events, we have an event monitor. So the team goes out, they set up their event and there's somebody back at the office or working from home a lot of times these days, um, who's checking their sample photos and is available via text. Um, if there's some setting that needs to be tweaked or something that's gone wrong, even if it ends up being a physical thing, like, Hey, we're out of paper or like, something to make it in the car, you know, we need a way to send it to us or get back to it so that the person on site has a backup. They're not, you're not sending them out there on their own. And I think that's huge, not just for the little technical things that all that do come up. Hey, I need the setting tweak. I need paper, but just that the, they know that they're supported. Um, because sometimes it can be really easy, just especially as you start to grow and you have more events going on where, if you're a booth owner, you're not involved in every detail of every one. If you're sending staff, it's really easy for you to be focused on something else and that staff to really be kind of left on their own. And if you want to keep staff and you want good staff, you know, you have to support them. So there's a way, I mean, the technical side is very important too, and you got to make those tweaks and get those paper. But I think what people miss is having that supportive structure for their event staff. I don't want to misspeak, but I'm having flashbacks i think there's a core values for your company right and isn't that one of them we have your back yeah we we, uh set up core values for our companies a company a few years ago and one of them is we have your back um and we 
try and embody that both with our clients. You know, we have their back and a lot of times with these agencies, you know, if there's some issue, you know, we are there to support them, but also internally with our staff, um, whether it's the staff at events or at the office, if somebody on the marketing side is putting something together and needs help with graphics, someone on the event graphics people can help them out. If there's a tech thing that needs to be tested at the office, but a person's working from home to call in and say, you know, hey, I need some help. We, you know, our team knows that they uh, should have everybody's back and they know that the rest of the team will have their back. What about in terms of uh, people always wonder how to get the better jobs, the cool gigs that you guys get? Is there any advice on uh, how do you get that kind of work or how do you get to the level where that work starts coming to you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is putting in the time to kind of grow your skills, not just, again, not just technical skills, but the the creative skills and the logistic skills. I'm trying to think of a good word for that, that middle piece. The people skills, I guess, isn't quite right, or the client interface skills. Um, to start getting better with the clients to, so you can offer more, not just offer the photo booth and the graphics and the technical thing. For us, once you get to that level, it's really about being part of the client's team. Uh, that's really how we think of it, about it, especially if it's something like an agency or a brand. If they call us, they call us up to try and, and do an event. Sometimes, you know, they'll have a very specific need, especially if it's a client we've worked for and they go, all right, we need this green screen, we have this graphic and put it all together. But a lot of times they say, Hey, we need to promote this product. The client wants something cool. This is the theme. What have you got? And for us, it's not like, oh, we'll just do a green screen with this. We get on the phone with them. We brainstorm ideas. You know, at that point, we're essentially part of the team planning the event with them. Hmm. Um, you know, we're not working on the catering and the other stuff, but we're now a piece of the puzzle that's really integrated with them rather than just something they're purchasing and adding on. That's probably the most fulfilling work, right? But I, I love that you brought that up because I think one of the other things about LA Photo Party is that you guys have a team or some some kind of way of constantly innovating, uh, doing creative work. Um, so I, I like to read books on like Disney and, and these entrepreneurs that have that, I don't know, that element. And I don't even know if you can package it and explain it, but is there any advice or, or thoughts you have about how to foster creativity in your team, how to work towards innovation? How does that happen? Um, it's really tough, I will say. And we've had ups and downs i think with the innovation and we're always looking to try and and get even more new stuff and i'll kind of answer your question a little bit also with what hasn't worked for us um because we've tried to be like all right we want more new products and more new things and more cool things because the clients always say what's what's new what what have you got and we've tried a couple times over the year having like an innovation task force or a new idea group of the people who uh you know might be most most able to kind of put that together, you know, from our tech side on the software and hardware and marketing and get them all together and go, let's, let's, what's the coolest thing that we can come up with? And it hasn't worked. Um, when we've tried to do like, tried to be innovative just to be innovative, um, it hasn't worked. Like we've ide generated ideas, but then like haven't been able to follow through. And I, it's something it's actually came up recently and it comes up a lot. Um, and I think about, okay, why didn't that work? And where did the successful ideas come from? And a lot of it is giving people the space to innovate in the work they're already doing and not just in what they're already doing, but the space of, Hey, I saw this cool thing online. I think we can use it to do something new. And if I design this other thing, you know, we'll do some other new thing and get that space to have an idea and follow it. Because that's what it is. When if you sit in, sit in a room and say, okay, let's come up with an idea, that idea is coming from somewhere. It's <laughs> you saw something and you, you, yeah. um, it's not just seeing something and copy it, but like it triggered a, an idea. Um, I'm trying to think of the word, uh, like that you follow down the hole, the rabbit hole, and come up with an idea in the end of something you can do. And so that's always coming from the outside. So it's really about keeping that space to get, okay, I got this spark of an idea. You, you know, our team brings it up somewhere, talks to somebody else to, if it needs hardware, if it needs software, to be able to follow that and make it happen. So I think it's more about having the space in your regular work 
to make that happen rather than say, okay, I'm going to sit down and come up with the next cool thing. Innovate now. Like <laughs> with a blank piece of paper. It's, it's uh, you, the thing that I thought of when you said that is like someone who's a comedian comes in the room and like, say something funny. And the, it's hard to do that, right? You can't bottle innovation. But I love the answer to maintaining the space to see uh, the opportunities, yeah. the things that spark the innovation. It's more of a response. You can't fabricate it. It's a, a response. So on that topic, um, I know the whole pandemic period was a challenging period. I'm sure you guys were trying to figure out new things, new innovations, virtual events. Um, there's a new product you have coming out. Yeah. Can you walk me through the process of like what the company went through um, since we're talking about innovation and seeing oppor- and having the space to see things and capitalize on things? Uh, absolutely. I'll start again with another uh, counter example. <laughs> I probably shouldn't, but it's a really good one. Um, where in this case, I couldn't see it coming because I did not see the pandemic coming um, and try not to beat myself up for that. But um, all of the virtual booths, you know, we have our own product and there's other competitors out there came out with the, the pandemic and kind of I think everybody had the similar idea at the same time, um, which I think can happen a lot where just the conditions of the world and the technology and COVID, like this idea made sense and, and we all pursued it. But we actually had our first virtual booth, I think, four years ago. Um, it was done for a specific client that had a need, uh, from, you know, they wanted to promote a movie on site at an event and also have people to be able to do it virtually. And the general idea was the same. You use your phone, you use uh, your computer, it adds a background a logo, basically the photo booth experience. And after that, we pursued it for a little while, um, and tried to kind of add features to it and pitch it to clients and it never really took off. And we kind of just left it to the side and focused on other things. And then as soon as the pandemic happened we saw the same thing other people did and said okay we got to revive this and finish building the features and put it out there um so that's one where in this case i couldn't see it coming but you know it was that original space uh where we started that and there was this client wanted something that people could use at home and we figured out how to do it and had that available to use in the future and I think something that people will be curious to hear from you from from your perspective, from LA Photo Parts perspective, uh, do you have any stance on the future of virtual? Do you think that ship has sailed? Do you think there's going to be a hybrid kind of world? Where do you see that playing in going forward? I see it as a hybrid world. I think, honestly, like a lot of things, like it had a big bump when it started. I think it's going to go down. I don't think it's going to go down to nothing. I think it's going to kind of level off. And I mean, especially these days as things are still in flux with COVID and some events getting canceled and there could be another, uh, you know, variant and all of that. So it could be a lot of ups and downs in the like short and medium term, medium term in the next few years. I think if you, we get to a place where COVID's not an issue ever at all, um, I think it'll still be there like, a, and, and kind of at, at like a lower level than what it is now or what it was at the bump where it's something you can offer as an add-on or for certain events. I mean, like this one we had before COVID was even a thing, you know, they didn't need it because of the pandemic. There was just something they were trying to offer for guests who couldn't come to the party. And there's, that's going to be an issue for forever. Some people can't make it to some things. Right. Is there anything that you're seeing now as trends or, or new things that maybe people should be focusing on? I don't. Or things that are just trends that you should avoid? <laughs> I know is the really the answer. I know you're looking for a specific trend to avoid or go for. My thing, if you want to focus on something, I think it's more about the creativity. It's about finding a way to use your tools to offer something. And that doesn't mean avoiding trends. It doesn't mean going for trends because both can be ways to do that. And it's what works for you. If you want what people are talking a lot about is it a trend is the 360s these days. If you can get a 360 and find a good way to promote it and make graphics that work well and sell it to your client, it can be great, whether it is a short-term trend or a medium-term for the next year or two. I mean, it's going to cover your cost of the hardware and software and figuring that out if you can sell it for a year or two, or if it's for five years or for forever, if it's a long-term product for you, then it's going to make sense. So for me, it's not about finding the trends. It's about finding ways to offer creative solutions to your clients. So on that note, I think this would be really interesting if you're, if you're open to it. A client, like you mentioned before, says, hey, we have this product. We want to promote it. Show me what you got. Come up with something. Yeah. 
you can't, like we just talked about, you can't force creativity. You have to have the space open for it. How does the LA Photo Party team, like, what do you guys do? Do you sit in a room? Do you start brainstorming? Do you write things on a whiteboard? Do you sleep yeah. on it? Like, what is the process that you go through to come up with a cool creative activation? Yeah, I mean, it starts with looking at what the product they're selling is. For us in LA, it's a lot of movies and TV shows. So, you know, we, we look at what's in the show, and for us, uh, a lot of the ways I try and think about it uh, on the tech side is we try and do like the cool movie effects to 90% of their coolness for 0.9% of the price. Because if you're talking about a movie with special effects, hundreds of millions of dollars, we're not going to get the same thing from a photo booth as literally a hundred million dollar movie, but that's okay. If you're at a party and you do a cool thing and it's like the movie and really cool. We put somebody in the poster. We put somebody hanging on the side of a plane um, that would not fly in a big screen, you know, uh, Tom Cruise movie. But we can do that at a party um, for uh, a reasonable price. It can be really cool. So it really starts with looking at the product or the movie and going, all right, how can we integrate the guest that's going to be at a party to give them a cool experience and a cool output? Um, and then do you have multiple ideas that you go back to the client with or do you guys come up with one and pitch them that one? It depends. Sometimes there's one good idea that um, is pretty obvious that's the best one. Uh, a lot of times if, if the movie has a cool movie poster, it's put the person in the movie poster. Like you got the cool thing. Like you don't need to, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. If there's a really cool poster, you put the person in it, it's going to be a cool output. Um, sometimes it gets more complex than that. You know, I think of a disaster movie back in the day that we had, uh, you know, a bunch of options. There was a person running from a sandstorm in one part of it. And, uh, you know, we made that an option and, and a person like freezing instantly. And we did a thing where yeah, the guest face would freeze and there'd be icicles, icicles from their beard and the client ended up wanting all of it. Um, so that was, that was a big win. I think it'd also be cool because I know you have a new product coming out, um, the Explorer booth. Since we're talking about creativity and stuff, how did that come to life and how did the team come up with that? And uh, can you explain that to it? Yeah. So it was kind of a combination in our process, looking at what is needed and what our, what we call our sweet spot is. Essentially, what are we really good at? Because that's what we want to put in it. So we looked at kind of what we needed, both from, we look at our events team because we go out to events. All right. What are our clients asking for? What do our, staff wanted an event what do we want to offer and in this case it was uh, a really flexible uh, uh booth that was the main thing that came about really early that we need because we need we have some clients that want a roamer and some clients that want a booth in one place for a day and some clients that they don't have power and so it was like all right how can we offer um you know there's always trade-offs but all of the flexibility and so that became an uh, a big focus really early on and when we look at, you know, our capabilities, um, I think really strongly about, you know, we manufacture um, our bodies out of aluminum and made in the U.S. Um, so I go, okay, how can we make this really cool and work with our aluminum manufacturing capabilities? You know, we don't want to take this over and make it in China. We don't want to make it out of plastic. Um, and we put those together and kind of start uh, iterating from there. We try and go really early to get like a digital prototype and then kind of tweak that a little bit and get an early physical prototype that's uh that first one's always a bit uh shaky but that's the point you get it because once you have it physically in front of you um you start really seeing the little things that need to change and sometimes the big things but even that first prototype we took it to events we did drop-offs and we had it at, you know at our office and beat it up a whole bunch and then had 80 tweaks to really come up with a product that fit all of those needs and find out what were the things that then annoyed us about that first prototype because we're using it at events hmm. or what are the things we can do better. So for example, I knew we, you know, with an iPad booth, you want to lock it because people will steal iPads, um, unfortunately. And so we had just, you know, a lock and key mechanism on it and people, everybody was worried about losing the keys. I was constantly being like, who's got the key. <laughs> this is our only prototype. We can't lose the key. And and uh, one of our guys, Joey, was like, we can't do this keys. You, it's just not working. And so we switched it to a combination lock. And it just, like, that little thing just makes it so much easier to deal with. You're never worried about the keys. If you're dropping it off at a place, you tell somebody the combination. If they forget, they text you, you text it back. You don't have to worry about handing them the keys and them losing it. Um, 
So just those little tweaks that are, you know, that, that was one spot, but all over the place that make one less thing to worry about, one more thing that's easy to do um, is something we really look for in all of our hardware and software. Yeah, I, I mentioned that I love that you guys actually do events. So you get this, like you battle test it, you see what's wrong with it. And it's really the simple things. Like I always think back to the example of uh, like for decades, people will drag luggage around with no wheels. Like, and yeah. somebody finally said, you know, let's put some wheels in this luggage. And I'm like, man, that's <laughs> so obvious. How come no one thought about it before? So um, the, the one for us, I always think of, you know, it's no put wheels on luggage, change the world thing. <laughs> but um, for our first Infinite booth, I don't know if you remember before that, every booth, including the one we had before that, um, the cameras would be mounted on these mini tripods that you'd have to you put the camera on and you tweak and you tighten and they'd angle a little bit and you'd adjust it and you tighten it and it angled the other way. And you'd either have to spend hours with it getting exactly horizontal or you just live with it being, you know, a little off. And so for ours, we went like, we can't do this anymore. It's such a pain at every event. You got to get it just right. And it's terrible. And so we built this new mechanism that just goes to horizontal and you loosen a thing and you flip it around to just vertical and you tighten it and it's just that one motion it's not a tripod that can go anywhere like you can't get it off kilter because that's not an option um and you know i see similar things like that more now yep. but like that type of innovation from like if you're not at events you would never see that because you hey it's a tripod you can set it to, to horizontal you can set it to vertical that's what people need but it's not like that's the bare minimum people need what they need is something that's easy to go from horizontal to vertical. And so that's the type of like little thing and events that I really think of. That make a big impact. Yeah. Why did you decide to do the um, Explorer booth on Kickstarter? Um, we wanted to kind of get it to as big an audience as possible. And, you know, Kickstarter is kind of a known quantity. We looked at doing the pre-sales ourselves, but, you know, we're a photo booth company and a, we do that really well and kickstarters has their whole system of pre-orders that they do well and we said hey we don't need to build a pre-order shop let's focus on the booth and we'll use kickstarter and all of, all of the tools they have available another thing that i i'd love to get your opinion on that i find is a common question with people is always like which booth should i get which software should i Ours. use?" <laughs> so Mine. trying to be unbiased um <laughs> Do you, do you have any advice on how people should think about that, how they should analyze products? Does it matter as long as they can get the output the client wants? How important is it and how do you think about analyzing it? Yeah, to be fair, the industry has matured so much. There are a lot of great products out there. Of course, I think ours are the best, but um, to be really fair, there, there are a ton of great products and there's a lot of overlap between them and and picking between them can be hard. I know for us, the thing we look for is kind of a few things. You're not just picking a product, you're picking a company to work with and partner with. And especially if you're talking on the software side, um, you're going to be dealing with them for a while, hopefully with new features and updates and, you know, support if you need it and training. So it's, it's finding a partner you want to work with rather than just a company rather than just a product mm -hmm. is I think a, a huge factor. Um, and the other big thing I think I, I look at, and you know, we do purchase products for things that we don't build as well. So I'm definitely on the other side of this is a product that can do what you need, but also that you can grow with. Um, especially if you're starting out, you know, you might have one feature or one specific need that you're really focused on. And sometimes it makes sense to focus on that thing for a while, but you want to have the capability in the future to grow or pivot or, or, you know, shift if you need to so for me it's about okay it can do what i need and it has the capability to adjust as my needs adjust yeah i think i think the same way even about branding like you don't want to lock yourself in with your brand name into one thing <laughs> uh you want to leave yourself open to growing into other things um and in closing i'd love to ask you if you have any other final remarks final bits of advice for people that are trying to learn how to grow their photo booth business um, my big, big advice would be talk to people. Obviously, we're we're filming this here at PBX, so in person you can just you know network and talk to people and how did you do this and hey that's cool, you know what's up and just get into it. But you can do that not at a trade show. You can message somebody on Facebook or email them or yeah, yeah 
or I was going to say text, but probably not. Message DM. somebody on Facebook, the, the DM, DM on, the cool on Instagram, one, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> reply to their TikTok. Um, and I think in this as in this industry, I, what I've found is, you know, there's a lot of great people out there. They'll let you know, you know, they'll, they'll be open to helping you out and giving you advice and just being there for you. So that's what I would say is kind of if you're looking for something, put yourself out there. The worst that happens is you don't get a response and you know, you didn't, you lost two minutes sending an email. Um, you know, for us, we think of our clients as, as partners, you know, we have, have, you know, our competitors in LA, a lot of them have our products. And at this point they're our partners, not our competitors. Um, we work with events with them a lot of the time, uh, you know, we're not, we're not fighting with them. We're, we're working with them. And so I think that's a little different, but it's the same type of feel where you can reach out to people and be a partner or be a friend or be a mentor or just get a little advice. Um, even if they're a competitor where they should be uh, wise words. And I think the mindset of not viewing, uh, people as competitors, but potential partners, I think that's important for people to keep in mind as well. Uh, David, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully you guys have a successful show. Thanks for having me. Awesome.